don't know him. He, he really is a kind of a role model for how we study the biosphere. Uh, he's a scientist scientist. Uh, he started out working as an ecophysiologist, force physiologist with Dick Waring at Oregon State. And he made a lot of pre water potential measurements. So he understood drought and he understood how plants work. And the other thing he learned from Dick is how to ask questions and not get caught up with too much detail to really find what's, what's important. Um, from those fundamental work, he kept trying to push the system and he developed this thing called Forest VGC. It's one of the earliest forest biogeochemical cycling models that could work at the watershed level with uh, Ramakrishna and Imani here. And they were interested in looking at carbon and water. And then he kind of got into this, this competition with Dave Schimmel to go global and had a global GPC. And yet to go global, you need to have satellite information. And so he worked a lot over the years with NASA, was really one of the pioneers with the MODIS project and did a lot of MODIS validation that also needed FlexNet to do the, the validation. So uh, Steve's a great speaker, uh, very approachable, smart guy, fun to work with. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with him over the years. Uh, he is retired now. Uh, he does have his own special parking space in Montana that he might tell you about. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, welcome, Steve, and I uh, look forward to hearing your, your, your lecture for the FlexNet community. All right, good. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, I, yeah, you need to stop before you give away too many of my fun finds. <laughs> uh, let's make sure that the screen sharing is up. Can everybody see my first slide? I just see your slides. Looks great. Okay, I guess I I can assume that everybody can can see it. Yeah, uh, I yeah this this is hopefully uh, when you have a invite some white haired guy to give a talk, you figure oh my god this is going to be a a dull history lesson, and I'm hoping I can make it uh, not a dull not dull anyway even if it is a history lesson, and so uh, I. It it certainly um, well. Let's let's start with my first slide <laughs> um, because you nobody should try this anymore. But when I wrote my Modus Science Team proposal in 1989, I offered no validation at all. I uh, I put in that I could come up with this algorithm, we could program it up, we could crunch it with the MODIS data, and we could do global daily photosynthesis. Uh, but I had no idea how I could possibly validate it in any way at any scale. And, and luckily, since nobody else in the whole country proposed anything like that, I got funded anyway. And so what I hope to do in this next hour is uh, kind of talk through the scaling logic, particularly is what it amounts to, that I went through to um, get to the point of the global data sets that now are just routine. Uh, this comes right off the FluxNet, uh, the, the Oak Ridge FluxNet website. And, uh, and so probably uh, most of you have read this before. Uh, it really was um, started at this workshop in Latuil, Italy. And Dennis and Ricardo Valentini uh, put this workshop together. It was coordinated by the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, which is, is sunset by now. So, um, that was where we first got the, the idea that a set of these newly emerging flux towers could actually be organized at the, uh, around the world, uh, which is the kind of thing IGBP was working hard to facilitate. And it's where I got the idea that, geez, here's the way I could actually come up with a validation strategy that would uh, at some level be uh, global and uh, would be credible. So I, I'm only half joking to say it saved my career because I had no other idea. So I hosted the first 
what we would call official FlexNAP meeting in Polson in 1998. And that's when we started thinking through what I laid out in this diagram, the idea that, okay, if you had a flux tower right in the middle of your, of your region, and we had a, a footprint that that tower was representing, and that was, of course, an active part of, of uh, research in itself, but we'd have a footprint of the tower. We could then be doing samples in the region around the tower, particularly to understand how well that tower represented the regional biome it sat in. I mean, we have to remember that any given tower site in and of itself isn't all that interesting, except to the effect that it represents a wider uh, uh, piece of the landscape, a wider, ho relatively homogeneous biome type. So we were thinking through this sort of conceptual scaling, uh, connecting the tower, and of course, then with the earth observing system going overhead. Uh, the paper that came out of that workshop is this one. Uh, uh, came out in Remote Sensing of Environment in 1999. I want to specifically call out, even though I'm sure they're not online, Roger Dahlman from the Department of Energy and Diane Wickland from NASA for years and years were this two most prominent uh, program managers in our research agencies supporting this. And, and they certainly at their end of, of uh, the funding of all this deserve an awful lot of this credit. So at the time, notice this was a DOE workshop uh, then in 2007, we continued to try to think of what are the measurements we have, uh, what where do they sit in space and time, um, uh, uh, two-dimensional space uh, and a three-dimensional space, uh, uh, spatially and then temporally. Uh, one of the things I learned real quickly as I started imagining global scaling is you couldn't do too much about what you wish you could measure. You had to learn to work with whatever was measurable. So at the go global scale, there are so few things that were actually measurable and you had to just work with what you had. Uh, we did a lot of this kind of then uh, initial uh, geospatial thinking uh, with early GIS tools, which of course now are just totally routine, but we were imagining how you would have these data layers that uh, you could uh, lay uh, over a landscape and um, then put these pieces together. Uh, I want to I want to now give you a little bit more idea of where we started from, and I, I say we, I guess I'm really referring to the, Earth, the terrestrial earth science crowd. And this quote, I, when I first read it years ago, and I saw who wrote it, Dave Keeling wrote this sentence in 1968. And it, it illustrates that back then, we really thought that global warming was still a long, long ways away. We really were just academically curious about how carbon moved around the world, but we weren't, we didn't have any, any political or societal uh, concern at, at that point that, uh, you know, we were in, that we really needed to figure this out to save the world, which I think uh, is really the case we're in now. Um, my, my first work is dentist related. This was my master's thesis work with little seedlings up in H.J. Andrews of, of Oregon. And I, I think back, uh, Dick Waring and Paul Jarvis actually got me these uh, and built these uh, early instruments. This is before LICOR ever existed, I'm pretty sure. And so this was what I was doing for my masters. 
this is what I did for my PhD. Uh, I found out that stressed trees close their stomata. Duh, I'm sure, I'm sure you're all saying, really, what a discovery. But in 1975, that actually was a discovery. And, and the biggest thing was this is our first abilities to go out in the field and measure gas exchange in any way. And, and a dentist can give you better you know, blow by blow history if you wanted. Uh, but as I think back to then, the only gas exchange measurements were being done in the lab back in the 70s in these early, very primitive cuvettes. That picture is the cuvette I did my PhD work with. And, and you notice I could measure about a 10, about an eight centimeter long piece of twig. I would put in that cuvette and that was it. And that was what I was hoping was representing what that whole tree was doing and, uh, and uh, what the whole stand was doing. And yet, of course, we recognized that a statistician had, would die if they, if they heard that level of sampling was gonna represent a whole stand. Uh, and, and in fact, I remember Bill, William Colby Smith's father, Bill Smith Sr., hammering me at an ecology society meeting when I first said that I was going to try to calculate photosynthesis of an entire hillside. And he said, running, we can't even do a single branch of photosynthesis. They, doing a whole hillside is just crazy talk. This gives you an idea what we knew about global NPP at that time. And I, I love this figure from Inez Fung uh, paper of hers and, and because it just shows you that we had absolutely no global data sets of, of any kind. Uh, back then, you know, the weather forecasting was providing atmospheric science just a little bit of a global perspective. But we in terrestrial ecology were absolutely starting out from ground zero. And we had no way of measuring anything, glo anything global, anything. And then came Compton Tucker. And this to me was the pivot point. Uh, you'll notice this uh, cover of science is 1985. And so Jim from about 81, on until this cover, his team at Goddard, um, Jim Tucker with Chris Justice and John Townsend and Sam Goward, uh, and this whole group was figuring out from a weather satellite that, gee, we can get something useful uh, from these basic uh, spectral indices for vegetation. And of course, it's the immortal NDVI. And I still remember at the time us thinking, wow, what in the heck is this NDVI? I mean, it's a dimensionless index. And um, wh what does it actually mean? What is it telling us? Um, but it was clear to me from, from seeing those first ND NDVI material, I would say a couple of really critical theoretical papers by Pierce Sellers related NDVI, FPAR, and leaf area index from a fundamental level of physics. His papers were a level of theory I could have never done, but I could certainly read them when I caught on. And what I saw was, okay, this NDVI, somehow or other, I can get leaf area index. And of course, LAI, was something us in terrestrial ecology and micrometeorology we're already familiar with. And so from absolutely day one of me designing the old forest BGC, um, uh, uh, ecosystem model, which I'm certainly not going to grind you through this, this old flow chart, uh, other than to point out to you that the logic was leveraging LAI every single way I could possibly do it, because I thought this is my one connection to scale, and, I, and there's no other one that I can identify. 
So off we went. Um, I hope everybody has one eureka moment in their uh, career. And this exact figure was mine. I was sitting in Australia uh, with uh, uh, Joe Landsberg and Ross McMurtry on sabbatical. This was in 1986. And Jim Tucker had sent me some of these early NDI, NDVI data sets for a couple of test sites that I'd been working on with my forest BGC model. And they, I was trying to cover a climate spectrum. So I had Madison, Wisconsin, Gainesville, Florida, Fairbanks, Tucson, uh, places, you know, in, 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 in climate space that would, uh, would cover climate space of, of our ecosystems. And he was able to send me these NDVI uh, data sets that they were processing at Goddard. And I remember scaling the NDVI in Quattro Pro and, and you know, doing, doing the little calculation in the spreadsheet and popping up this exact figure and my jaw just dropped. Is here it showed that on its own, this NDVI just uh, uh, in, in temporal dynamics represented the seasonality of uh, this um, forest, this theoretical forest in Madison, Wisconsin. I recognize I was moving a generic mean tree around the country uh, <laughs> was what I was doing. And, uh, and I couldn't believe it right there. I said, okay, this NDVI is worth figuring out. It's worth working with. It clearly has something critical that it tells us about these terrestrial landscapes that if we figure it out, we can go a long ways. And so off we went. That's when I started imagining these kind of uh, diagrams, this comes from an early NASA global habitability uh, 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 report. I think back in it, we, we literally had the luxury of being able to brainstorm in the widest way. There was no prior ideas on, in global ecology that we had to spring from. So when I think back to it, it's just amazing that we could cook up anything we wanted. This was what I cooked up. Gee, if I could get the daily local meteorology and somehow knew the biome type, and if that satellite gave me leaf area index, that's all I need for a simple photosynthesis model that I could then drive uh, 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 an ecosystem model and ultimately end up with a global carbon model. And so in 1983, the way I lobbed this in to the global habitability document and uh, it's there still. Uh, in a more regional scale, I added, particularly with Larry Band, um, uh, brought along the topographic analysis that I had no idea how to do on my own. And we developed this regional hydroecological simulation system, which was basically forest BGC, then being driven in a similar way, but with topography. And um, this, is, this is what uh, came straight out of Rama, Rama Namani's PhD thesis. He was the uh, the computational engine behind this, the, these wild ideas. And we did a 1200 square kilometer uh, piece of uh, Western Montana for, as you can see, LAI, evapotranspiration and photosynthesis. Um, this was the first color plate of remote sensing ecology ever published. And I remember at the time we had to arm wrestle with Bill Schlesinger for ecology to go through this expense of doing a color page. They'd never done a color page before and it cost a lot of money at the time. Well, of course, what I was dreaming is being able to look at that landscape like this, which once we got our, modus, uh, our Mod 17 going, that same landscape, we can represent uh, more like this, which certainly shows way more of the realism and, um, and 
is kind of representative of our capabilities now. So I proposed these, these uh, ideas and uh, I got assigned to the MODIS instrument planning document for MODIS that went from 19 about 83 and was published in 1986. I, I want you to notice the time from do, the document plan 1986 until it was 14 years till we got uh, uh, got those uh, sensors off the ground. And this is an issue that to this day, uh, remote sensing really is trying to work at tightening that time frame from concept uh, to launch. Um, and so I ended up getting funded because I had no other competition, I guess. And uh, they said, okay, uh, you build us a global photosynthesis data uh, algorithm and data set. And as I started thinking about that and we started laying out the computational procedure, uh, we had 120 million cells that we were gonna have to compute every single day. And of course, if you started with plot level ecology, <laughs> my whole PhD was 13 lodgepole pine trees. And suddenly you have 120 million cells to compute every day. I thought, man, I've got to start from some of the basic, most basic first principles I can to get my head around this. And so really this goes back to your undergraduate plant physiology text, I would have to admit. I mean, you remember those old functions you'd see in the textbook for the temperature curve of photosynthesis versus temperature, um, the radiation curve, uh, photosynthesis versus radiation. And I basically, in effect, just copy those fundamental um, uh, uh, functional types are connecting temperature and radiation to uh, the photosynthesis. Now water, of course, was the killer. And I, of course, that was my specialty also. And so I stood for a long time, how am I going to deal with water? Because I wanted to get to uh, this kind of an analysis where I could assemble the temperature, light, and water constraints at, for, a, for each square kilometer and uh, that representation, because they had to do it 120 million times a day. And so this is kind of a conceptual look that uh, an old, uh, one of my PhD students, Matt Jolly, uh, put together that gives you just a visual look. That imagine a boreal forest where uh, you have serious light limitations at high latitudes that control the middle of winter. You also have serious uh, uh, temperature constraints. It's way below freezing. And uh, when those are finally uh, relieved in the spring, then your photosynthesis comes up until maybe uh, summer water stress uh, starts uh, dinging it down. And then you contrast that with it in this example in African savanna, where it's just about all about water stress. Uh, at those low latitudes, you never have a big day length change. You have very little temperature seasonality. It's all about water, water, water. And so I, I imagine, okay, with each of these 120 million cells, can I at least represent this variable climatic control in a simple way? Now, uh, what, what was, <laughs> maybe I should say my downfall, the water part I've stewed about for years, because of course I'd done water stress field research. I had forest PGC, which was really, um, was designed to amplify water stress controls. And yet it was clear I couldn't do a real water balance. I had the MODIS ET, algorithm under planning, but I particularly didn't know how I could ever get a daily precipitation globally that'd be any good at all. This is back in the 1990s. So I finally decided I'm gonna do water stress 
purely from vapor pressure deficit. And uh, boy, have I been pilloried for that decision for decades. Probably a few people listening to this are the ones that pilloried me because I have heard many times how, how deficient that is, that was as a water stress constraint. And of course, nowadays people have lots better ideas, but this is 30 years ago. And I had to think of every one of those 120 million cells, what I could actually get. And I figured at least I could, from the daily meteorology, get a decent and stable v VPD calculation. So that's what I did. Uh, you put all that all together and you end up with a kind of a growing season link like I'm showing here. And what I find kind of ironic is, you know, I haven't talked about any physiology yet. So here I was a tree physiologist and yet all I was doing was bioclimatology at this point. And yet I realized I, I had no idea how you're going to scale physiology thinking, but I did know how I could scale this sort of daily, uh, daily meteorology. So I went first to doing as much as I could with the meteorology and then really, um, the, the, I had to count on the leaf area index as my measure of, of uh, the, the canopy itself. So about that time also, we started uh, doing biome VGC global simulations to understand the climate space of NPP um, in water uh, water balance and, and temperature on the left there. And then we started looking at where the flux towers. Uh, this was in 1998. So in NPP space, so to speak, uh, the, the, the light dots there are all the simulated NPP worldwide. And then uh, we, I started looking at, um, for that paper in 1999, where are these flux tower sites? were. And of course, one of the, I hate to say problems, it was just realities, is that every flex tower was basically sited wherever the local PI could get funding. And so in no way were we able to have a top-down strategy of we need towers here and towers in this biome and towers in, you know, wet and dry uh, conditions. We just didn't have any of that kind of control. We had to just take whatever towers came along. And I think we're lucky we did as well as we did. Um, so then we finally get to launch uh, Modus on Terra, December 99, Modus on Aqua, May uh, 20, uh, 2002. And then here it was, our first global photosynthesis from Modus. And I still uh, remember our excitement when we first were able, were able to just simply do the computation and then map it out on an image. I mean, we were just, you know, just dumbfounded looking at these first images. We did it. And it kind of looks like the actual world. And, um, but you rec I recognize, of course, er way earlier that once the euphoria of actually doing this wore off, how do you know if it's any good? I mean, you could pick any given cell here and zoom in and say, is that what's really there? And of course, that's where FlexNet saved my career, is while I was writing uh, at our NTSG team, our mod 17 and mod 16 algorithms, Dennis and Ricardo and uh, the flux tower crowd were furiously putting up flux towers all over the place. And so by, by then we had towers and systems, the early regional tower systems, as you can see here, not only Ameriflux, but Euroflux, um, and uh, in Asia, there were towers getting going. Australia, certainly, we had some great teams there. And so about the time I needed these, boy, they had started to arrive. This is the FlexNet map as of 2006. And uh, 
when I think of how little confidence any of us would have had in that global photosynthesis map without these towers. I mean, I would have just, you know, I just would have had no way of defending uh, whether my Mod 17 data set was any good at all without these. And of course, now I, I just pulled this off, I think it was the, the FluxNet uh, website a couple of days ago. And I look at all these different towers. Uh, geez, I think there's 500 of them or something. Um, or, and how many years we have. And of course, we only dreamed, uh, dreamed of this 20 years ago. And here we go. And so very quickly, uh, we, as the MODIS data streams started to, to roll out, uh, lots of teams started putting together these sort of analysis of the, the MODIS data sets and um, against uh, the, the flux tower measurements. And um, I thought through really pretty mechanically, okay, how, how do I, how do I uh, kind of uh, specifically target aspects of the mod 17 algorithm to, for validation as specifically as I could? And I, I realized pretty quickly, well, part of it is, did, I, did the satellite meteorology actually represent what the tower measured, uh, which was huge? Secondly, did the MODIS FPAR and LAI computed by, as it turned out, Rangamayanini's uh, algorithm, did the FPAR and LAI actually get correctly what the tower teams on the ground were measuring uh, at their site? And then finally, uh, the ecological part, does my, or did my simple representation of plant physiology, that uh, was all pyro into this biome property lookup table, BP LUT, did that actually do an adequate job of representing the dynamics that the tower people were, um, were measuring in day-to-day -day, uh, gas exchange? And of course, uh, all of those things were things that on the ground at the tower sites, they were all over this. So they, they absolutely had on the ground what I needed. Um, and so I came up with this, this uh, strategy of mixing and matching the tower measurement, the MODIS measurements, uh, biome BGC simulations and pulling them in and out so I could identify each I could isolate each variable and evaluate how it was doing against what actually was measured on the ground. Now, you tower people and, and, and Dennis will probably laugh, but I considered all the tower measurements as absolute truth. They, I had no choice. I just figured that's the facts. I'm not worried about any variability or uncertainty of those, I just take it as gospel and off I go. And uh, I know Dennis lectured me many times about how that's only partially true, but I just had to work with it. Um, one of the things that became clear pretty quickly in that first couple of years after the MODIS uh, data stream started to go, and I was that a lot of the tower teams were, were kind of reluctant to hand over their flux data. And so here I came roaring in and, and said, uh, you know, send me all your flux data and all this ancillary data too, your LAI and your daily uh, meteorology. And it finally sunk into me that it was really a one-way street. I was all taken, no give. And I thought, I've got, to, I've got to make it worth their while. I've got to offer something in return. And so that's what became the modus ASCII subsets, as they were called. And what I cooked up with the Oak Ridge team at the time, the Oak Ridge DAC, was that they, for any tower 
that signed on to FlexNet and gave specific geographic coordinates, we, they would automate going into the MODIS daily data stream and take get each one of these products that you're seeing there, uh, land cover, surface temperature, NDVI, um, all of those, and we would package them literally at, in an ASCII format and email them to you. Make it as easy as they possibly could for them to actually take a look at how MODIS was seeing their tower, uh, their tower site. And I think when I think back psychologically that this was just a massively pivotal point uh, moment because then it was then it was an equal trade. Uh, I was giving them things that they could use to absolutely determine how well they could extrapolate beyond their tower. And of course, they were saving my career by validating my global photosynthesis uh, and ET data sets that otherwise were just gonna be smoke and mirrors. And so to me, I don't even know if these are still going. Uh, maybe everybody just gets this all from Earth Engine to begin with. But at the time, this was a real breakthrough. And uh, I know uh, Dick Olson at Oak Ridge said that, boy, this just turned the corner of the tower people being interested in the MODIS data sets when it was delivered on a silver platter to them. I know this was how it used to look like. I, I know I pestered Margaret years ago about whether this was even on Ameriflex. All of this is probably so old, it doesn't, isn't even essential anymore. But at the time, it was a real critical data handshake between the MODIS land team and the FluxNet uh, teams that I think really cemented our interaction in a, in a fabulous way. And probably one of the most important ideas I had was more of this uh, scientific sociology than the science itself. So then I could go, and this is just as an example of where I could see how the satellite meteorology was doing representing the tower meteorology. And so just as an example here, the temperatures, the VPDs, I could see how I was doing on every tower site around the world. And uh, of course, 10 years earlier, I had no clue how I would have done this. And so I was giddy uh, that this was even a capability at the time. And of course, I could then compare the tower uh, measured GPP straightly, straight against the mod 17 daily GPP. Uh, I could then uh, calculate it with the satellite meteorology and with the tower meteorology. So I could uh, really explore um, how well the MODIS land data set was doing at every single one of these towers. And I think, uh, and of course, lots of other teams could do the same sort of analyses. I know now there's tons of papers that have done this now. And because it, it really uh, worked from both ends, uh, the, the broad global spatial end and, the, and down to the tower validation end so well. And you could look at every different uh, uh, biome type. This just looks at a grassland of, how in a grassland it, it greens up in the spring for a while and then uh, basically senesces and is brown the rest of the year. And so being able to do this in towers all over the world was what gave me and I guess the science community some uh, understanding of, of what these uh, Mod 17 uh, GPP and PP data sets uh, uh, actually were, were seen and how well they were representing reality. And uh, even to the, uh, so this is a, a Harvard Forest uh, GPP against uh, what they measured on the ground. There's just been tons of these papers done, which is just great. And of course, then we put this all together and Raman Namani had our first big science paper in 2003. We, we were able to use the MOD17 algorithm and go backwards 
to the old AVHRR NDVI data set. And so we could stretch our analysis back to the beginning of uh, Jim Tucker's AVHRR NDVIs and, and provide even by 2003, uh, this uh, what 18 year time series. And so science took that for sure. Um, number of years later than Mao Jing, uh, Zhao uh, had another science paper where by then we had a, oh, uh, this was in 2010. So by then we had a decade of the MODIS data set, but we're also again able to leverage the, the AVHRR data set. Uh, the algorithm doesn't care which satellite delivers the FBAR and the LAI. It just needs to know the FBAR and the LAI from whatever source. And so uh, we were able to go backwards and stretch this out. And of course, now there's lots of papers that have done this uh, since. And uh, it really has given us a look at uh, what uh, Global NPP is doing. And uh, I, I thought after looking at that, that uh, it actually showed NPP going up slightly and this is about the time the planetary boundary ideas uh, of Johann Rockström et al. started coming out. And I thought, you know, the, this NPP kind of acts like a planetary boundary too, because it's completely constrained by the global meteorology. And it's actually pretty darn stable. If you go look at that previous graph, it's plus or minus only about 3% in its interannual variability. So I suggested, gee, maybe this ought to be a planetary boundary too. Uh, it has a lot of relevance in things like bioenergy, food security, climate stabilization, certainly quantifying terrestrial carbon sources and sinks. And so uh, I, I put that out in a, in a science um, perspective note, and uh, I don't know how far it's got, but I thought it was a good idea. Uh, and what it really is, uh, um, to me, then gets me thinking, and of course, coming to today, when we look at our global carbon cycle, this allows us to look on uh, both sides of the equation at the, at the CO2 source dynamics from deforestation and wildfires, things like that. And of course, then from the terrestrial sink side of the equation of, uh, of the terrestrial carbon sinks. And I always use this, this figure from the annual global carbon project and thank Pep Canadell profusely because to me, it's just a, such a great one slide summary. What I see now and uh, you know, I, getting here to the end is We've, we now have global data sets of, uh, you know, of all sorts of things. And what I see now is so much more critical is asking the important questions of what, what do we need to know that these global data sets can answer? And I'll just give one example from something we did with uh, my old student, uh, uh, Bill Smith in a bioscience paper in 2012. They were beginning, this was when bioenergy was starting to be talked about a lot. And so this left-hand curve shows a whole bunch of papers that claimed the amount of bioenergy that could be generated from the terrestrial biosphere by harvesting uh, the terrestrial biosphere. Well, uh, Bill and, and, and Mao Zheng and I thought, okay, let's let's do a, just a mind game. Let's just pretend we clear cut the entire mod 17 global NPP uh, with the exception of national parks and wilderness areas and things. But let's just assume that we virtually uh, would harvest the whole NPP. Well, we illustrated really quite convincingly that these economically based estimates of, bio, of future bioenergy were absolutely impossible. 
to me, it was just a great illustration of where a global data set and asking a critical question really focused reality on what global bioenergy capacity might be. And as you can see, it was on the order of a quarter to even a tenth of what the speculation was. I think this illustrates the sort of things we need to be doing a lot of now is really uh, getting uh, uh, after some of these societal questions that are really important. Uh, you know, we have, this was uh, my terrestrial uh, carbon monitoring diagram of, uh, of uh, I can't remember, 20 years ago. Every component of this exists now. I think there are international efforts to um, coordinate this in a more uh, formal and fundamental way. And I think now it's so much more important that now we have all these global data sets at our fingertips and that we really home in to these kind of critical um, global change questions and use these data sets. And, and I think it's so much of a different world for a, a young scientist than when when uh, Dennis and I started 40 years ago and we had a blank slate and said, go figure out how to do global ecology. Uh, nowadays, we have so many data sets. The big issue now is how can we answer critical questions with this avalanche of data we have? And so I'll, I'll end by saying uh, these, uh, these data sets on Terra and Aqua, there, those platforms are almost out of gas, literally out of gas. They aren't controlling their orbit any longer, and they're going to be switched off uh, in the data stream pretty uh, any month now, I think. I'm not keeping up so well. But the VIRS follow-on has been up for a few years. These algorithms and data streams are fully continuing. I know the Europeans are also uh, bringing up uh, uh, similar data sets. And so I think uh, what we generated with the daily uh, GPP and evapotranspiration from MODIS, I think is going to continue on. And of course, probably a few of you listening are part of, they're getting way more clever algorithms that don't have to uh, deal with the assumptions I had to in the 1990s, because there's so much more available uh, data, global data sets now to do so much more advanced algorithms. It's really fun for me to see what's coming on next. Uh, and with that, that is the end. All right. So. Thank you, Steve. Okay, what do I do? Stop screen sharing. Let's do the, okay, good. Now I see everybody. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. This. Thank you, Steve. This is really a great uh, talk, providing a great insight for both flux and remote sensing community. And I can clearly see the importance of handshake between two communities to advance our science. Uh, so I I think we have about ten minutes for Q and A or discussion. So if you have any anything to talk to Steve, then. Yeah, you can unmute yourself and talk to Steve. I think I'm already seeing Margaret responding to some of my queries. I, I can't read it quite, but I think she's saying, hey, guess what, Running? We're already doing the stuff you're whining about. <laughs> oh, well, us old guys, you know how it goes. Any, let's okay, see. Great. Thank you so, so much. It's, it's so great to see you and, and hear from you. And I thought I saw a couple hands up. So hopefully people will raise their hands and then they can ask some questions. Oh, yes, and I don't know. I need somebody to kind of proctor and, that. And Steve, I... maybe you don't know where Amer Ameriflex is having its, um, we have a theme year. It's actually two years of the year of remote sensing. So this is a really hi a highlight this yeah and of course in yeah. today's world there's 
more and more advanced sensors. There's all these global data sets. You know, we really in the 40 years have gone from complete, um, complete opposite from having almost nothing except theory to work with uh, in 1980 until now we have just, just tons of, of global data sets and sensors ready to, to work on these. Uh, and so it, it's clearly time for me to retire. <laughs> yeah, I see Christian raise your hands. So you wanna mm -hmm. unmute yourself and answer? Yeah. Like? yeah, thank you so much, Steve, um, for this for this lovely talk. But before you retire, do you see uh do you see a new discipline popping up that is that blank slate today that that you had then? Do you see a new frontier? Oh, that's certainly the question <laughs> that young scientists need to be asking for sure is what what really is needed now? Um, it isn't quite new anymore, but I guess what I see is we need to be able to do full life cycle carbon accounting of just everything now. I, a good example that I think we can relate to, look at corn ethanol. I, it sounded like a good idea. The corn farmers got in the political game and got all these uh, subsidies rolling. And then the scientists caught up and said, you know what, we're not saving any emissions one bit by using corn ethanol. And to me, it's an example of we've got to be doing full carbon uh, life cycle analyses of just all sorts of things uh, with uh, these data sets. I guess that would be the one example that comes to my mind. Because it then fuels the decisions and priorities we make for things like emission reduction and all those. Uh, gee, Crystal, is that her hand up? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Steve. Oh, what did I get wrong in my BRDF? No, you're doing just fine. <laughs> I learned it all from you, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, uh, I make the albedo products for Botus and Beers, and I've leaned on um, uh, Ameriflux and the whole FluxNet um, because of the upward and downward looking uh, radiometers to serve as my, quote, global um, validation. And um, we certainly leaned hard on, on Steve's early work in setting up that idea of spatial representativeness is the tower representative of, you know, fat modus or Beer's pixel or even fatter Beer's pixel. Um, but I wondered if, if you just speak a few words about, you know, we're moving towards not, not 30 meter Landsat products. Um, SBG is the big hyperspectral instrument to look forward to in the future that's that's you know that's not going to be yours or my instrument but um <laughs> you know it's it's uh, it's certainly interesting uh work coming along but that whole spatial you know we're down to 30 meters which still isn't completely representative of an ecologist sitting in a little patch under a tower you know no but it is pretty representative of land ownership scale and of mm. particularly small farms in a lot of the world. And so I think, yeah, it, it's kind of funny that one kilometer uh, global data sets are so passe nowadays. <laughs> and certainly the frontier is global 30 meters and we've got the computers that can crunch it, which in 2000, was impossible to even imagine. So I think for global analysis, getting to something like 30 meters is, is pretty darn, I hate to say good enough, but I think we'll be able to work with that for a long time, even though you're not identifying individual phyto elements, which is what the theoreticians call plants, you know, um, you're still representing, um, farm fields and land ownership pretty well. Great, great. Good to see you. We uh, we missed those meetings in Montana that we used to have. Man, those were good meetings, good vegetation meetings. Yeah, I hosted four 
global vegetation workshops and that was all part of getting the FlexNet world and the Modland world working together. And uh, yeah, when I finally fatigued of running those, uh, I heard a number of people complaining, come on, have, have one more meeting. Uh, ben has a hand up. Yeah, hi, thanks for the great talk. I really appreciate it. I'm curious if you just have some thoughts about ways to speed up that pathway from conceptualization to launch. It's clear that we don't really have time for 16 minute delay or 16 minute, 16 year delays. And um, they still seem quite long. So is it in the theory, the conceptualization, the expense, the politics, the instrumentation, where should we put our efforts to reduce that, that timeline? Yeah, that's, you know, I'm, I'm co-chairing the, the National Academy Earth Science and Applications Committee right now, kind of my final activity of career. And we look at that and um, partly the sensors are getting more complicated. The easy ones are already up there. And so as we push the envelope on sensor development, uh, that's difficult. We struggle with, I guess, the economics of flying test instruments. We used to have an aircraft, uh, pretty big aircraft campaigns around NASA that we, you'd put your test uh, instruments up. And, and now the space station has ended up being a, a critical uh, test bed because you can't run a whole mission off just a conceptual sensor. And so every step of the way, in some ways, is more complicated. I think we do have it shrunk. Well, boy, it's still partly also is then you have to compete with all the other missions. Yeah. And uh, when you look that, okay, we're the terrestrial ecology crowd. Well, the cryosphere crowd has a sensor they want. And the, of course you look at things like grace with uh, what it's done and the ocean crowd. And so around NASA, it's a continuing competition in, for the mission queue. And so I don't think it's getting much shorter even though from a pure engineering point of view, you could probably go from sensor to launch in something like six or eight years if you could just go straight through. Thank you. And we also have a, a question in the chat. So uh, how do you think these efforts can be applied to food, energy, and water research? Okay, yeah, and see, that's the sort of thing that I think uh, we really need to be helping society on sorting out. I, I take food for, um, for as a good example. We certainly, with things like the Mod 17 data set, uh, can be identifying regions that are really dropping below, that are on a downward uh, decline in uh, NPP. We could really do a, some early warning uh, it, for things like uh, food production. Uh, as you start drilling to individual crops and the other issues, it gets uh, kind of out of the satellite domain. But I think uh, early regional scale uh, warning for food's a, a good example. Uh, for energy, I already touched on biofuel. I think we, I know there are some papers, as I remember Chris Field and, and, uh, uh, and some of his friends did a paper where they tried to identify, in effect, unused landscapes that were really just kind of scrub land that nobody was paying attention to and tried to innovate identify here are landscapes that could maybe be resurrected for bioenergy production. And so that's, you know, an example of where uh, for energy, uh, this kind of data could be helpful because I think our, our initial swipe from 10 years ago has to be remembered that in no way can bioenergy carry the whole transition away from uh, liquid fuels, but it can help 
some places and identifying where and how and prioritizing it, I think is pretty useful to society. And of course, then there's water and I'm watching the Colorado River um, debacle right now, which we've been predicting for, geez, my hydrology friends for 15 years, they've been saying this day's gonna come, this day's gonna come. And of course, having a regional scale look at that whole water balance is what uh, the large scale regional analysis is built to do. So I think we all, our kind of science has a role in all of those areas, but we just kind of have the science role. We have to then be teaming up with the economists, the social scientists and things to decide, you know, what should si we recommend for society to do? Let's try to not have any corn, more uh, corn ethanol debacles. We don't have time for those mistakes. Great, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think it's, uh, yes, it's about time to let Steve, you know, leave. <laughs> so. Hey, yeah, so I'm retired. I have a big agenda the rest of the day, of course. I think I'm gonna go to the gym after this. Because it's snowing outside. It really is. We just got another inch of snow. Oh my God, okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thanks for a great talk, uh, Steve. And yeah, hope, hope to see you in, in the future webinar again, I think. And thanks yeah. everyone for joining us too. All uh, right, thank you. This was fun. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.